Good evening. Love you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And we'll be looking this evening at Daniel chapter 1 and the first two verses. Sir Isaac Newton wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel, and I wouldn't advocate everything that he said in that commentary. But he did say, to reject Daniel's prophecies is to reject the Christian religion altogether. He recognized that what Daniel observed looking back in history and looking forward in predictive history was everything when it came to the truth of the Bible. He recognized that the Bible made truth claims about the past that accorded with history to the T, and therefore its truth claims about the future must likewise be heeded. So this evening we dive into the historical section of the book of Daniel in the first two verses. Let's read together Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Let's pray together. Lord, we are here this evening to look into your word, and really rather to have your word look into us to ply our hearts, to plow hard ground, to renew faith like a two-edged sword, discerning our own hearts, our thoughts, our motives, separating out that which is pleasing to you and that which needs to be tried again in the furnace. God, we pray that the truths of your word would become conviction for us and the penetrating nature of your word in the hands of your spirit. Uh, would do its work with surgical precision to uproot idols, to dislodge from us worries and anxieties about political things, about the rise and fall of various empires. And Lord, may it solidify us this singular hope that your kingdom come will crush all other kingdoms, that you will reign, that you will rule, even as you always have reigned and ruled from heaven and governed the affairs of mankind, you will reign manifest on the earth. And so we pray, even as you taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Use this book, this study, even this night, to that end for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking this evening at what is truly the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Uh, you and I have only ever lived in the times of the Gentiles, and those times began properly in 605 B.C. Uh, with the very verses that begin this book. We're going to look at this section, these first two verses, really in three parts, and they are the three parts that are designated by the three major sentences in Daniel 1, 1 and 2. And this really sets the stage for all that we're going to be looking at, not only in the first half of the book of Daniel with the telling of the story of Daniel and his three friends, but in the latter half of the book of Daniel with the unfolding of God's future plans for the world. We read in verse 1, in the third year, the king, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. A pretty simple summary of that is Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem. That is what is going on here in this verse, and we're introduced to names and places with which we need to be familiar. Daniel writes, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and if you were an astute reader of Jeremiah 25, verse 1, for instance, you might notice that the siege of Jerusalem is listed in Jeremiah 25 as the fourth year of the reign of the king of Judah. 
And the critics of the Bible love to point to a supposed discrepancy between Daniel 1.1 and Jeremiah 25.1 and see Daniel says the third year and Jeremiah says the fourth year, therefore the Bible can't be trusted, it all falls apart, all of you Christians should close your Bible and walk away. And we're going to find once again that Daniel, Daniel the book of Daniel, becomes the anvil that smashes all the critics' hammers once again. Uh, and it's just fun to sort of point this out, to recognize that with patience and careful study, the Bible's veracity is proven again and again. This is just one example. And if you were to get a book on Bible errors, uh, this so-called discrepancy would show up. We need to understand something very simple. Daniel is writing from Babylon, and Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 25, 1, was writing with a Jerusalem perspective. What's the difference? The difference is in calendars. The, the way that Babylonians counted the reigns of kings did not count the year that the king became king. They called that the accession year. And then once New Year's Day started, which was in the Babylonian month of Tishri, then uh, the first year of the king started. So if we just sort of make this a, an American calendar feel, if you became king in October, the first year of your reign was until January 1st. And so when Jeremiah talks about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar laying siege to Jerusalem in the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign, and Daniel mentioning it's the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, it just affirms the reality that Daniel is in fact in Babylon, and he is ascribing history, describing history from a Babylonian perspective, while Jeremiah does so from a Hebrew perspective. Just in case you were wondering about that discrepancy because you did your devotions in Jeremiah 25 this morning. Let's think back just a little bit about the end or the demise of the monarchy in Israel. A list for you, the last five kings of Judah. There were 19 kings of Judah since the split in Israel. Uh, those 19 kings covered 345 years. There were eight good ones, 11 bad ones. Of course, there were no good kings in the northern tribes. They were all bad. But the last five kings of Judah begin with Josiah. And you may remember King Josiah, eight years old, finds the Bible, starts unfolding God's word for the people and bringing the country back into conformity with God's law. He was a good king. He was, in fact, the last good king of Judah and the southern tribes. And he was killed by the Egyptian king uh, Pharaoh Necho at the Battle of Megiddo. And this was when Egypt was trying to make a play against the Assyrian Empire and vie for power. And you remember that the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, is right in between the, the trade routes and the war routes between North Africa and Europe and Asia. And everything sort of converges there. And so if empires are going to war against each other, Israel is going to be right in the mix and get trampled, taken over, used, abused, etc. And ever since the heyday of the golden era of David and Solomon and the Israel being a reigning power in the era, in the area, ever since then they have been run over by the various wars of empires. So Josiah, the last good king of Judah, was killed by Pharaoh Necho at the Battle of Megiddo. His son Jehoahaz, who was the younger of two sons, became king. And, and it is quite possible that people realized that the older brother was going to be a terrible king. So the younger son Jehoahaz was placed as king, but he was dethroned after three months by Pharaoh Necho. Pharaoh Necho wanted somebody that he could work with. So Jehoahaz was taken away to Egypt and he died there. Jehoiakim, the other son of Josiah, he was the 17th king of Judah. He reigned 11 years. He was placed there by Necho. He was armed by Necho. He was supplied by Necho. In fact, Necho changed his name. His birth name was Eliakim, which means God places and Pharaoh Necho changed his name to Jehoiakim, which means Yahweh places. I don't know why Pharaoh Necho decided that his name should be Jehoiakim instead of Eliakim, except that naming somebody meant that you had power over them. And it is at least ironic that Necho, the Pharaoh over Egypt, who is using Israel like a puppet, renames Judah's king and names him after the personal name of Yahweh. It's almost like Egypt is in control, and yeah, you can have the personal name of your God while I'm telling you what to do. 
Really, all of these wars of empires are wars of theology. They are wars of a regional deity pitted against another regional deity. My God is bigger than your God type of thing. And when wars are won, the gods are praised. When wars are lost, the gods are blamed. And whichever empire is on top clearly has the strongest gods. That is the theology at stake in the military adventures of these empires. And then you had Jehoiachin. He was king for three months. He was also a wicked king, and he was captured by the Babylonians in 597 B.C. He died in Babylon. And then the last king of Judah is Zedekiah. He reigned 11 years. He was the one who had his sons murdered in front of his very eyes, and then his eyes plucked out. So the last thing he saw was his sons murdered, and then he's hauled off in bronze fetters to Babylon. This is the demise of the monarchy in Judah. And Josiah was a good king. After that, they were all wicked. And it is this downward spiral of a loss of independence and a furthering of the idolatry and hypocrisy that plagued God's people. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem in Jehoiakim's third year and besieged it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, you've heard this name before. He gets to be famous in biblical history. His name has the god Nebo in it. And his name probably is Akkadian and means something like Nebo, protect the firstborn, or Nebo, protect the prince. And so the wars over empires were really theological battles dressed up in military garb. Even the names of kings and rulers did homage to the gods of their lands. Nebuchadnezzar was the son of Nabopolassar. Nabopolassar was the Babylonian king who finally gained Babylonian in independence. Babylon was an ancient nation, an ancient empire that had gone sort of out of phase for some time. And for hundreds of years, the Assyrians were king of the hill. And Nabopolassar was the Babylonian king that brought about what we call the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the resurgence or the rebirth of Babylon that brought it to its world-class magnificence. The Babylon that the Greeks wrote about as the best of all ancient civilizations. The Greeks said that they got all of their astronomy knowledge and mathematics knowledge from the Babylonians. The Babylonians were the ones who built the hanging gardens, the, one of the wonders of the ancient world. And it was said that there were three buildings in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon that rivaled the hanging gardens. So this was a world-renowned civilization coming to the fore under Nabopolassar in his reviving and gaining of power. And he gained power while Assyria was on the decline, and he allied himself with the Medes and with Scythian armies. And Nabopolassar saw the fall of Nineveh in 607, which was the end of the Assyrian Empire. And by the way, if you lived under the Assyrian Empire, under its capital of Nineveh that really reigned all over the Middle East, you would think that nothing could stop the Assyrians. E even at the end of their empire, the, uh, the capital of Nineveh was sort of a, a rock fortress up in the mountains that nobody could touch. They didn't have enemies to the north of them. They were able to keep everybody else out, and they really fell apart internally. And so when Assyria was weak, Babylon began to be the rising star in this clash of empires. It was only Egypt that had a reputable fighting force left in the area. And Egypt's pharaoh at the time was an old guy who'd fought his battles young, and now he was just ready to retire. But when he died, an upstart young pharaoh with a fighting spirit decided to take the spoils of the fallen Assyrian empire. He marched north to do just that. He knew he would have to take care of the little puny Babylonians. Who are they? And yet he met a surprisingly cunning general. He was the crown prince, the son of Nabopolassar. He was the general Nebuchadnezzar. And he met the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish and soundly defeated them. It really was effectively the end of any hopes for Egyptian supremacy in the area. After this battle, Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and approached Jerusalem. That's where we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar has just as crown prince effectively become the king in the stead of his father in the western provinces. He's defeated the last arch enemy of Babylon and has secured Babylon's place as the reigning world power. And now he has approached 
little tiny Jerusalem. Morally lost, spiritually adrift, compromised in every way possible, full of idolatry and hypocrisy. And he has gotten there just at the right time. In 605 BC, he approached Jehoiakim, he took Daniel, he took stuff out of the temple. He made effectively Jehoiakim a vassal, that is a slave king. You get to sort of be a king here, but you have to do what I say and you have to give me all your money. In 597 BC, there was a second siege, and in 586 BC, he saw the end of the monarchy completely with the death of Zedekiah, or with the captivation of Zedekiah, the destruction and burning of the temple, and the raising of Jerusalem. The third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And when you read world history, you think, well, that seems only right. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's on the ascendancy, Babylon is on the rise. A serious day is done, Egypt, Egypt is out, it's Babylon's turn. Jerusalem's just in the way. We come to verse 2, and we find a change of subjects. In verse 1, it was Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar does this. And look at verse 2. The Lord gave. That is a striking sentence. We've been talking about geopolitics. We've been talking about the rise and fall of empires. We've been talking about what really smart generals do. And now this all of a sudden got theological. In fact, this phrase, the Lord gave, occurs three times in this chapter. There in verse 2, down in verse 9, God gave Daniel favor in the sight of the officials. And then down in verse 17, God gave the youths, the Hebrew youths, knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature. This is a behind-the-scenes look at what is really going on in world politics. You can read the newspapers all you want, but you need to come to verse 2 and read the Lord gave. There has never been a change of power that does not come with this theological caveat. Every king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like channels of water, and he directs where he wants there's never been a presidential election out of sorts with God's perfect, unchanging, unflinching plan. There's never been the fall of an empire without his doing. We don't always see it. We don't always read it in the papers here. Daniel pulls back the curtains for us just a little bit. The Lord gave. This is the theology behind the scenes. Nebuchadnezzar did not make Israel his subject by his cunning, his skill, by his gods, or by luck. And notice this is the Lord gave. This is the Hebrew word Adonai. It simply means master or the one who is in charge. There are other places in Daniel where the divine name is used, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping, self-existing God of Israel. But here it is Adonai, master. The Lord gave. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. If you were in Israel at this time and you're just looking at the politics and you're looking at the change of the guard and, and you see the, the mighty Babylonian empire coming, they just beat Egypt and now they're coming for us, you would say, boy, Nebuchadnezzar just made Jehoiakim his vassal, just made him his slave, and now we're all subject to the Babylonian empire. Now, that is not what's going on here. God gave Jehoiakim into his hand. In fact, Jeremiah 25, 9, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't feel like he's God's servant at that point. Nebuchadnezzar is pretty sure he's king of the world. In fact, he'll say something like that later. Nebuchadnezzar was in charge as far as he was concerned. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar didn't feel like God's servant. Uh, E.J. Young says he was an instrument of the divine will. And this is like Assyria as an instrument of God's will. The, the previous empire was in the same boat. Turn to Isaiah chapter 10. In the world's politics and the change of empires, 
we have effectively gone from one servant of God to another servant of God, accomplishing his purposes on the map. In Isaiah chapter 10, we have this assessment of Assyria. Look at verse 5. Woe to Assyria. It starts out with culpable judgment. Assyria is guilty. So, woe, condemnation to Assyria. The rod of my anger, says God. So God's angry, and Assyria is the rod of his anger, and woe to that rod. Assyria is the staff in whose hands is my indignation, says God. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against people, the people of my fury. And you're thinking, wow, Assyria was the worst country in the world. Do you know what they did to people? Boy, it must be a really godless country that God is going to send Assyria against. And who did God send them against? Israel. Against his own people. I commission it against the people of my fury to plunder, plunder, and to seize spoil, to trample them down like mud in the streets. And notice verse 7, yet Assyria does not so intend nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather its purpose is to destroy and to cut off many nations. It says, are not my princes all kings? Are not Kalno like Carchemish or Hamath like Arpad or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? What is Assyria saying? Jerusalem's idols are nothing. I destroyed the other idols and they couldn't stop me. Well, that is an indictment on two counts. Israel has not been known around the world for devoted, faithful worship of Yahweh, the one true God. What have they become known for? Idols under every green tree on an every high hill, worshiping the gods of the nations and serving them. So God is sending Assyria to punish Israel, those northern tribes. So it will be, verse 12, God says, when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. For he has said, by the power of my hand and by my wisdom I did this, for I have understanding. <laughs> what does all this mean? God uses an evil king, an evil army, an evil nation to accomplish his good purposes in keeping with his faithfulness to his promises to Israel. And God doesn't get his hands dirty. The evil king and the evil nation, they do all the dirty work and they do it for their own dirty reasons. And God is able to use sinful moral agents to accomplish his good purposes with his good motives for his people and for their good, ultimately. God is faithful to himself. And then he can turn around and punish the rod of his anger. He can turn around and punish Assyria because they were truly wicked. Assyria did not sit around and say, hmm, what I really want to do is honor the one true God. You know the God of Israel? And if they have forsaken him, I want to teach them a lesson and help them be faithful. That's not his motive. Stated here by Isaiah, his motive is just to crush countries. His motive is to rely on his own gods, his own deities, to boast in them. John mentioned this morning, Habakkuk chapter 1, where God himself says explicitly, I will do something that will amaze you. I'm going to bring the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, against Judah. And here we have that fulfilled in the third year of Jehoiakim. Let's zoom in on Jehoiakim a little bit. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 22. God gives a warning to Jerusalem and Judah. Beginning in verse 13, it's general at first and then it zooms in specifically on Jehoiakim. 
God, through the prophet Jeremiah, warns this way, Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting it bright red. Do you become a king because you are competing in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He pled the cause of the afflicted and needy, then it was well. Is not that what it means to know me, declares Yahweh? But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain and on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. Therefore, thus says Yahweh in regard to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they will not lament for him. They won't say, alas, my brother, alas, sister. They will not lament for him, alas, for the master, or alas, for his splendor. He will be buried with a donkey's burial, dragged off and thrown out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. This is God's assessment of Jehoiakim's faithlessness, his disobedience, his sin, and his sin compounded in his role as leader of the nation. And what would become of him? Turn to Jeremiah 36. We see his character come out specifically in his attitude towards the Word of God. Word had gotten out that Jeremiah had prophesied. Jeremiah specifically had told the people of Israel, Babylon's coming, and I'm going to take care of you there. I have a plan for you, and you need to go there and live there. And pray for the peace of Babylon. You're going to have homes, you're going to have vineyards, you're going to have children. You're being exiled from the land for some very specific purposes, but go there and trust me. Don't run away to Egypt for help. Well, Jehoiakim didn't like that. Jehoiakim didn't like what Jeremiah said about his own character. He didn't like the strategic plan that God laid out. Verse 20 of Jeremiah 36, they went to the king in the court, but they had deposited Jeremiah's scroll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe, and they reported all the words to the king. So the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll. He took it out of the chamber of Elishama the scribe. Jehudi read it to the king as well as to all the officials who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in a brazier before him. And when Jehudi had read three or four columns, The king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. Yet the king and all his servants who heard all these words were not afraid, nor did they rend their garments. Even though Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah pleaded with the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeramiel, the king's son, Sariah, the son of Abdiel, to seize Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah after the king had burned the scroll and the words which Baruch had written in the dictation of Jeremiah. They made another scroll. Look down at verse 30. Thus says Yahweh concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. This is one of those scenes in scripture where you're reading it and you just cringe don't do that. Don't take the Bible. Cut out the stuff you don't like and throw it in the fire. Don't you know what happens to people who do that? And he, is, he and his officials had no fear in doing it. Second Chronicles 36 tells us, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him with bronze chains, intending to take him to Babylon. It turns out he didn't actually take him to Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father died, and Nebuchadnezzar had to race back to Babylon to secure his own throne. Got back around to Jerusalem later, back in 597. But from that time, the king was a puppet, a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar at that time brought articles of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple. 2 Kings 24.1 tells us in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. Jehoiakim became his servant for three years, and then he turned and rebelled against him. Jehoiakim, after hearing from Jeremiah that the plan from God was to go to Babylon and be taken care of. Remember, we talked about last week the Davidic line and the Messianic line were at stake. 
God still had a plan. He still had promises he was going to keep, not only for the nation of Israel, but for all sinners who need forgiveness. And he just rebelled, didn't like this plan. And so behind the scenes, he was negotiating with Egypt and trying to build an alliance against Babylon. He rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was playing both sides of politics. When Nebuchadnezzar was in town, he would pay tribute. When Nebuchadnezzar was out of sight, he was buying off the Egyptians. It seems that he died of natural causes, but he was disliked and dishonored in his life and his death. His body was thrown over the wall. Jeremiah 36 says that his descendants will be punished for their iniquity and God would bring on them and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the men of Judah all the calamity that he declared, but they did not listen. So Daniel tells us that Nebuchadnezzar took along with him some of the vessels of the house of God. Not all of them. In the three deportations, he probably cleaned out all of the rest of the items, but in this first deportation in 605 BC, he takes some things. What did he take? We're, we're not exactly sure, but probably things like pots and shovels and meat forks. Seems that he took the goblets that show up in Daniel chapter 5. Um, look forward to seeing what happens when you take God's consecrated things and you set them up in the worship of your own deities. That doesn't usually go well. These were items that were made of gold and silver and bronze, but they were certainly more valuable than the materials they were made of. Again, this is theological bragging rights. Right? If the gods of Babylon can march their armies into the temple in Jerusalem and take Yahweh's stuff, is Yahweh even real? Maybe Yahweh's puny. Maybe he's gone. Maybe he doesn't like his people anymore. This is serious stuff. Isaiah, by the way, prophesied to Hezekiah that this would happen. Turn back to Isaiah 39. And you may remember the scene. This is a hundred years before Daniel's day. And King Hezekiah, who was a good king, was being attacked by Sennacherib. This is back when Assyria was the world empire. They were the real threat. And they had already decimated the northern tribes and they were coming for Judah and for Jerusalem. Hezekiah prayed. You remember he spread out the letter before the Lord and then God really did a remarkable thing. Killed 185,000 Assyrians in their army. And I love this statement in uh, Isaiah 37, verse 36. When men arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. And God miraculously saved Judah and Hezekiah from the attack of the Assyrians for being overrun by the Assyrian army. God answered Hezekiah's prayer. And then Hezekiah was sick. Hezekiah asked for a, uh, a, a stay on his health, on his life, God gave him a little bit longer life. In fact, the sign that God gave to Hezekiah is interesting. He held back the sun's movement during a day. He, he made the shadow go backwards on the steps rather than forwards. You know, if you were standing outside next to a saguaro cactus and, and you were watching in the afternoon as the sun is hitting the the side of the, whole, the saguaro cactus and making a, a long shadow. And all of a sudden, the shadow starts going back the other direction. That's what Hezekiah saw. Now, think about that astronomical phenomenon. That would affect everything. Babylonians were known for making precise calculations of sun, moon, stars, they had shaped lenses to look at things small. They had probably shaped lenses also to look at things far away. In fact, they would have had to because they had, prior to Daniel's day, the Babylonians had already calculated the, the, the size and the colors of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. In fact, the Greeks pulled their astronomical knowledge from the Babylonians. Is it possible the Babylonians noticed the sun going backwards for a little bit during Hezekiah's illness? Is there a reason they wanted to make their way to Palestine? 
Isaiah's prophecy to Hezekiah comes in a time when perhaps Isaiah was weak in faith, fearing the Assyrians, perhaps reaching out to this little country a little bit farther south and to the east called Babylon. Maybe I can get some help from Babylon against the Assyrians. And so Isaiah invites Merodach Baladan, a hundred years before Nebuchadnezzar, 705 BC, to come to Jerusalem and see the treasures. Isaiah 39, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold, the spices, the precious oil, and his whole armory, and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. That seems kind of silly. Would you open up your vault and your gun case and your bank account to a perfect stranger (laughs) in enemy territory? This is what Hezekiah did. Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and where have they come to you from? And Hezekiah said, they've come to me from a far country, from Babylon. What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasuries I have not shown them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of Yahweh of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left. Some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of Yahweh which you have spoken is good. Good? Why? Because it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And you see all these details of prophetic prophecy that just weave together. And this is exactly what happens in the third year of Jehoiakim when Nebuchadnezzar comes. Now Nebuchadnezzar has come. He returned home to Babylon in 605 at the news of his father's death. He secured his throne. He left Jehoiakim as a slave. This is the low point in Israel's history. It really is the demise of the monarchy, the demise of the theocracy. After these four wicked kings are off the scene, there is no one on the throne. And even during these last four kings, they are subject to foreign powers. What becomes of the Lion of David? The destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. would mean no temple, no Ark of the Covenant, no Shekinah glory. What is going on here? I think it's interesting that the story in Daniel starts with a reference to the consecrated objects from the temple. It doesn't start with Daniel. It doesn't start with his friends. This is a clash of theology. Remember the scene in 1 Samuel 5 where the Philistines haul off the Ark of the Covenant. And they take it into the temple of Dagon, their God. And you remember what happens? Dagon falls on his face. And they set him back up. If you have a God that has to be set up, that's a problem. They set him back up. He falls on his face again and breaks... Listen, I don't think you want to take God's consecrated things and defile them. God is going to topple a king or two. God is going to topple an empire or two or three or four or all of them. The third scene here that really sets the stage for Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar's committing these things to defilement. Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem. God gave Jehoiakim into his hand. And thirdly, Nebuchadnezzar commits the temple items to defilement. Look at the second half of verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. This word Shinar, it's an old word for southern Babylon, for Chaldea. This is the site of the Tower of Babel. When you go back to Genesis chapter 10, you discover that Nimrod, he was the guy called a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he established cities. And he established Akkad, which is the Akkadian Empire, and he established Babel in Shinar, which eventually becomes the Babylonian Empire, and he established the city of Nineveh, 
which becomes the seat of the Assyrian Empire. And you see this one man, Nimrod, setting up cities that eventually become the empires of the ancient Near Eastern world. You remember Shinar and Nimrod's field where the world gathered in Genesis chapter 11. They gathered in rebellion against God. God had commanded humanity to scatter and fill the earth and subdue it. And what did the people do instead? No, we're going to make make a name for ourselves. We're not going to scatter and obey the Lord. We're going to come together and we're going to build a mighty tower. And they built the Tower of Babel. It's right there in the plain of Shinar. This is the symbol then of rebellion against God, of humanity making a name for himself, not doing what God said, doing what they want to do instead. In fact, the word Babylon is an old Akkadian word that probably means something like gate of God, gate of God. This is man's attempt to make up his own rules about theology, to make up his own gods, to make up his own way to go his own path. In fact, it becomes synonymous throughout the rest of the the Bible's witness, synonymous with the epitome of wickedness and rebellion against God. In Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah chapter 5. And so Daniel, using the word Shinar here, it was an old word. It, It wasn't the word you would use in Daniel's day for Babylon. He's using it on purpose. It's a theological import. He is saying, look, Babylon is the seat of rebellion against the one true God. In fact, it becomes symbolic not just of one little empire's rebellion against God, but of humanity's rebellion against God. And that's where Israel's gone into captivity. And specifically in verse 2, that's where the sacred, set-apart instruments for temple worship were carried to. Notice Nebuchadnezzar took them to the house of his God. This could be translated gods, it could be plural. Babylon was polytheistic. Nebuchadnezzar uh, worshipped a number of gods. He was named after Nebo. He worshipped Bel at a great temple in Babylon, but his favorite god was Marduk. And he actually called Bel Marduk at times. He conflated what sometimes were two separate gods into sort of one identity to worship them in the, in the temple in Babylon. There were temples in Babylon to some 50 different deities. We'll look more at those next week as we look at the religion and the, the, the culture of Babylon that Daniel and his friends were brought into. Nebuchadnezzar's favorite god was Marduk. And the temple of Marduk had chapels dedicated to other gods, to various deities. In fact, at the temple of Marduk, some of the other gods of the regional cities, every city had its own sort of patron deity, those deities could come visit, which means that humans would carry a little shrine representing the deity to the other temple so that one deity could visit the other deity. And the temple of Bel or the temple of Marduk in Babylon proper was one of the greatest buildings of the ancient world. It really is a technological marvel. It was an eight-layered ziggurat, kind of a uh, Mayan or Aztec or Egyptian pyramid type of thing on four sides. And it was geometrically precise. Its corners were right on the cardinal directions. It had... Uh, important features that lent towards stargazing and understanding seasons and calendars and things like that. But it was bright and shiny. It was eight different colors and eight different layers, kind of like an audacious birthday cake. And it was built with uh, hand-baked bricks that were then covered in shiny enamel of various colors that represented different gates of a heavenly ascent. And in this temple, you worshipped Marduk or Bel with human sacrifice and prostitution. In fact, every woman in Babylon was required at one point to give herself in such worship. And so Nebuchadnezzar brings the sacred objects, the consecrated items from the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, to the plain of Shinar, 
near where the Tower of Babel itself was and put them in the house of his God. Don't do that. (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar is going to be humbled. The empire is going to be humbled. The text says here, he brought them into the treasury of his God. That is, he brought them into the, the trophy room. This is a military and theological statement that the gods of Babylon are the mightiest gods around. Our regional deities win. Therefore, all your gods are puny or don't exist. This is the my God is bigger than your God argument. And this is a defilement for the things that God had ordered for his own public worship to be brought into such a place would be shame on Israel, a defilement of those consecrated items. The truth is, these items had already been defiled. They had already been polluted. They were polluted from the very moment that idolatry was in the heart of those who said they worshipped Yahweh and also had compartments in their hearts for all the gods of the nations. The worship of Yahweh will be exclusive to treat him as some regional deity, one among many, to treat him as if he had peers, is to not know him, to not love him, to not worship him at all. And Israel had long ago been defiled. They had long ago polluted the sacred items and the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. <clears throat> The entire section here is worth reading, uh, verses 1 to 14, but we'll zero in on verse 10. For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Here's God's promise to Israel before the Babylonian captivity. 70 years, you're going to go there. And then I'll bring you back. You'll reach out to me. You'll pray. I will answer your prayer. Don't listen to the false prophets who say otherwise. And then the the famous verse, we might call this the crocheted verse. It ends up on living room walls, right? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Uh, That verse is not about your next career choice, just so you know. (laughs) Sorry, Tom. Uh, That verse is specifically about 70 years for captivity in Babylon. And, And why is it 70 years? Because for 490 years, Israel has forsaken her covenant end of the bargain. Israel has forsaken God's ways and and specifically manifest in the Sabbath. Israel was to trust the Lord every seventh year and let the land rest. And God is essentially saying, my land is going to get its rest and you have to get out of the land for that to happen. It's not just about Sabbath. It's not just about the land resting. It is about Israel's fidelity to God's word. And we might see a striking example in Jehoiakim of taking the Bible and cutting it to shreds and throwing it in the fire. But Israel has been doing that at the heart for 490 years. And so God takes them away. And what you need to understand about this section of Jeremiah 29, before it happens, God's already promised there's an end to it. He has his purposes, and his purposes are good. He's faithful to his own promises. His word always comes back true. And the 70 years is important. If we go, if we take 70 years from 605 BC, that takes us to 536 BC. In other words, from Daniel 1, the first exiles, all the way up until the first returnees to the land, 70 years. There's another way to count that if you go from 586 to 516. 586 is the fall of Jerusalem, and 516 is the rebuilt temple under Zerubbabel. 
Either way you count it, from first exile to first ter- returnees, or destruction of the temple to the rebuilt of the temple, 70 years. And that just reminds us that God keeps his word. This is what makes Daniel such a fascinating book. It's why Isaac Newton said, if you reject Daniel's prophecies, you reject the Bible. You reject Christianity. Because it gives us this unique view at the past, the present, the future. God always keeps his word in such remarkable precision. What a tragedy for Israel to forsake the one God, really the only God that exists, and the God who tells the future with such precision and exchange it for such garbage, such life-destroying idolatries. And we need this book. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for even this setting the stage for watching the lives of four sinners who are faithful to you, who have courage under fire, who believe your promises, who do not conform to the culture around them. God, we need to see their example. Bigger than that, we need to trust that you are the sovereign over all of human history and you are bringing all things to pass according to the counsel of your will, and you will one day reign on the earth and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you're Lord. Even your enemies will feign obedience when you reign on the earth. God, we look forward to that day. In the meantime, let us be faithful right where you have us in all the tumults and all the changes and rises and falls of human empires. We know that you are faithful. Help us to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.